This is the Pick Your Poison podcast. I'm your host, Dr. JP, and I'm here to share my passion for poisons in this interactive show. Will our patients survive this podcast? It's up to you and the choices you make. Our episode today is called The Culinary Catastrophe. Want to know what favorite poison of Agatha Christie's is also used as a performance enhancer? What compound was used as a rat poison and also in doping during the Tour de France? Listen to find out. Today's episode starts in Hong Kong. You're attending a conference and visiting some colleagues. As you're touring the emergency department, medics wheel a 27-year-old woman into a room saying she's having a seizure. An overhead speaker booms with an announcement about a code blue upstairs in the hospital. As you watch, the patient convulses in what looks like a seizure, freezing with her back arched and her face stretched into a grimace. Of course, we don't have a license to practice in Hong Kong and normally wouldn't be involved in her care, but this is a fictional case, so let's pretend we're the attending physicians. Per the medics, she has no prior past medical history, including no prior history of seizures. The nurses are attempting to get vital signs, but as I've mentioned before, this is difficult. The medics did check them en route. Her temperature was 99 Fahrenheit, or 37.2 Celsius, with a heart rate of 103 beats per minute, Her blood pressure was normal at 120 over 80, as was her respiratory rate of 18, and her oxygen saturation was 100% on room air. You ask the nurse who's placing the IV to get blood for a glucose check. It's also normal at 100 milligrams per deciliter. There are several different types of seizures. The most common is a generalized tonic-clonic seizure when a person loses consciousness and has strong jerking movements in the arms and legs. This woman's arched back and flex limbs are bizarre, but it looks like a seizure, so we'd better do something. Question number one, what is the first-line treatment for seizures in the emergency department? A. Naloxone or Narcan, B. Lorazepam or Ativan, C. Phenobarbital, D. Nitroglycerin. The answer is B. Lorazepam, a benzodiazepine. Barbiturates like phenobarbital are useful, but we consider them second-line agents because they have more sedating effects, so we reserve them for patients who don't respond to benzos. Neither naloxone nor nitro will help with a seizure. You give 4 milligrams of lorazepam. Nothing happens, and she's still seizing. You give a second dose. It also doesn't help. An isolated seizure by itself isn't a huge emergency. Most seizures stop by themselves, and unless the person is swimming, driving, or something similar, they'll wake up and return to normal. Patients with epilepsy certainly don't need to come to the ER every time they have a seizure. Status epilepticus, on the other hand, is a true emergency. We used to define it as seizures lasting for 30 minutes, but the definition was revised to seizures lasting for 5 minutes, or two seizures in a row without returning to baseline, in other words, waking up in between. Our patient meets the criteria for status epilepticus as it's now been ongoing for more than five minutes. What's the concern with status? First, it has a mortality rate somewhere between 10 to 30 percent. Not good. In addition, assuming she survives, there's a risk of brain damage. Not surprisingly, this risk increases with the length of the seizure, and this is the reason the time was shortened in the definition, as neurological damage can occur before 30 minutes. Question number two, which of the following causes status epilepticus? A, epilepsy, B, low blood sugar, C, fever, D, toxins, or E, all of the above? The answer, E, all of the above. Anyone with epilepsy can have status. Febrile seizures don't often result in it, but it is possible. We always check the blood sugar in seizing patients to rule out or to fix low blood sugar. We also hook them up to the cardiac monitor for monitoring, obviously, but also to check the cardiac rhythm and rule out an arrhythmia, which can look surprisingly like a seizure even to experienced eyes. Our patient's rhythm on the monitor is fine. This is a toxicology podcast, so let's get right to it. There are a lot of toxins causing seizures. In fact, seizure coma death is the endpoint of many, many poisons. However, there aren't that many toxins causing actual status epilepticus. Alcohol withdrawal, for example, commonly causes seizures, but almost never status. So the list is relatively short. It includes medicines like bupropion, an antidepressant, theophylline, an old drug for asthma, diphenhydramine, i.e. Benadryl, and isoniazid, an anti-tuberculosis drug. Anything causing high or low sodium, like ecstasy, for example. Causes of low blood sugar, like insulin. Camphor, formerly in Vicks Vapor Rub and currently used as a rat poison. 
carbon monoxide poisoning, and lastly, tetramine, a cage convulsant, which is about as nasty a toxin as it sounds. The patient's husband is in the waiting room. You send the intern out for more history while you give a third dose of lorazepam and decide what to do next if it doesn't work. You're relieved when the patient does stop seizing. Her limbs relax onto the bed. She's awake and alert, but barely moving and still not talking. The intern returns, confirming that the patient doesn't take any medicines, including over-the-counter meds, so it's not bupropion, theophylline, diphenhydramine, or isoniazid. Her labs are back with a normal sodium, and they're otherwise unremarkable. The husband was at home when she became ill, ruling out carbon monoxide. Anyone in the house with her would have developed symptoms as well. The husband says they don't have rats and don't use rodenticides, making camphor and tetramine less likely. That said, I wouldn't exclude tetramine just yet. Why not? Tetramine causes intractable seizures. It was banned by most of the world in the 1980s, but nevertheless gained notoriety in China in the 2000s. During a 10-year period, there were more than 3,000 tetramine poisonings and 225 deaths. High-profile cases included a shop owner poisoning his rival's customers and university students poisoning other students. Could it be tetramine? Yes, I'd cross my fingers and hope it's not the case. The treatment, if it is, same as we're doing, anti-epileptics. Just as you're about to leave the patient's bedside to call the ICU, the overhead speaker blares about another code upstairs. Immediately, the patient's body stiffens again. She has a strange expression on her face. Her lips are pulled back into a grimace. The arching of her back is now extremely pronounced. It's no longer even touching the bed. Good news, this is in tetramine bad news, it's something equally as toxic. The worst part is that our patient is completely awake, although all of her muscles are contracted and she's unable to move. You order another dose of lorazepam. Question number three, which of the following toxins could be poisoning our patient? A. Strychnine, B. Botulism, C. Tetanus, D. Cyanide. The answer? A and C. This could be either strychnine or tetanus. Botulism causes flaccid paralysis, not muscle spasms. Cyanide causes cardiovascular collapse. Patients with cyanide poisoning can have seizures, but they'd also have a low blood pressure, and she'd probably have cardiac arrest by now. Strychnine and tetanus both cause muscle spasms. Our patient's eyebrows are raised because of the contraction of her forehead muscles. Her facial muscles are also clenched, pulling her lips back into a terrible facsimile of a smile. This is called rhesus sardonicus because of the grisly resemblance to a sardonic grin. Her arms are on the bed, as is her head. However, her back is completely arched with only her heels touching the mattress, like a bridge pose in yoga but gone horribly wrong. Epistotonus is the medical word for this, and it's also caused by both toxins. Charles Bell's painting, titled Epistotonus, is an incredible depiction of the medical condition and it also conveys the true terror that's associated with it. It was based on his work as a physician with soldiers dying of tetanus after contamination of battlefield wounds. How do we tell tetanus and strychnine apart? It's difficult to do so definitively, but a few things do differentiate them. The main thing is time of onset. Tetanus usually develops slowly. Patients may have muscle pain and lockjaw symptoms for weeks to months. Symptoms from strychnine develop about 30 minutes after oral exposure. Also, the muscle exam is a little bit different. With tetanus, the muscles stay stiff in between spasms. For example, the lockjaw doesn't relax. Our patient's symptoms started one hour ago at most, so that's not consistent with tetanus. After the lorazepam, her muscles in her face relaxed. Again, unlike what we'd expect from tetanus, especially her jaw muscles relaxed. Strychnine is definitely the best answer here. What does strychnine do? It works in the spinal cord and interferes with glycine, the main inhibitory neurotransmitter. Inhibiting the inhibitor results in an imbalance and thus overstimulation. Overstimulation equals uncontrolled muscle contraction. The worst part is the patient is almost always awake during strychnine poisoning. You don't need me to tell you that strychnine is a lethal poison, and there are a lot of ways it can kill you. The first is respiratory failure. Remember, the diaphragm is a muscle, and if it's not working, the patient isn't breathing. Also, ventilation fails if the chest wall is contracted and frozen. Hypoxia or low oxygen results in anoxic brain injury. Renal failure occurs secondary to rhabdomyolysis or excessive creatinine kinase released during muscle injury. Patients can aspirate. They can get severe acidosis from unrelenting muscle contraction. 
Hyperthermia occurs with temperatures as reported as high as 109 Fahrenheit or 42.8 Celsius, and this is from the extreme heat generated by the muscle activity. Question number three, if we were in an under-resourced area, or say this was the 1800s, what might be a critical part of a strychnine poisoned patient's care? A, a dark, quiet room. B, cool compresses. C, frequent sips of water. D, warm compresses. The answer is A, a dark, quiet room was and can still be an important part of care. It's not a coincidence our patient spasms occurred with the sound of the overhead speaker. Any stimuli, especially loud noises, but even just turning on a light, can trigger the contractions. In the past, treatment included minimizing stimuli in the hope the toxin wore off before the patient died. If the person gets medical care in time, they can survive. So how do you treat strychnine poisoning? Well, there's no antidote, so treatment is supportive. First, I think about GI decontamination. I'd consider oral gastric lavage or pumping the stomach. We rarely do it these days, but it might help. Strychnine is rapidly absorbed, so the window of potential benefit from lavage is short. The tube is extremely large and goes down the back of the patient's throat into their stomach. It is without question a noxious stimuli, so you'd have to weigh the risks against the likelihood of any strychnine remaining in the stomach. Another option for GI decontamination is activated charcoal. Charcoal is good at binding to strychnine, a fact we know from a very dramatic demonstration at the French Academy of Medicine in 1831. Professor P.F. Torrey ingested activated charcoal with a lethal dose of strychnine and survived. Again, you have to weigh the risks against the benefits because charcoal, if aspirated, is very toxic to the lungs. And we've already mentioned the risk of aspiration with this poisoning. I'd have an extremely low threshold for intubating any patient with serious strychnine poisoning. Why? Several reasons. First, you can sedate and paralyze the patient, greatly alleviating their suffering. With sedation, they won't know what's happening, and with paralysis, they won't have the tetanic muscle contractions. Second, you can protect their airway, which I've already mentioned is a risk. And third, it reduces the risk of aspirating, increasing the safety of gastric lavage if indicated in a dose of activated charcoal. A critical component of treatment is stopping the muscle contractions with anti-epileptic or anti-seizure drugs. Lorazepam hasn't worked. Our patient's still twisted into a horrible backbend. It's time to try another class of drugs. A good second-line agent is a barbiturate like phenobarbital. You could also use newer anti-epileptics like phosphonatoin or levetiracetam. The choice of drugs is less important than the goal of treating until the seizures are controlled. Other supportive care includes cooling for hyperthermia and IV fluids to prevent renal failure. After 24 hours, sedatives, paralytics, and antiepileptics can be tapered down and hopefully stopped. If you can take good care of the patient, the toxin will be eliminated from the body and they'll survive. Back to our patient. You talk to the husband and agree to intubate her to protect her airway and relieve her symptoms. Question number four. This is a tough one. More of a toxicology board level question. What paralytic must be avoided in patients with strychnine poisoning? A. Succinylcholine or B. Non-depolarizing neuromuscular blockers? The answer is A. Succinylcholine. It depolarizes muscle cells, causing contraction, and so it should be avoided. We decide not to do gastric lavage since more than an hour has passed at this point and there's likely little strychnine in our patient's stomach. You do give a dose of charcoal, and now she needs close monitoring in the ICU in time for the strychnine to be eliminated. So while we wait, let's talk about where strychnine comes from. It's a tree native to Asia, the Strychnos nux vomita tree, and it's often referred to as the vomiting nut. Medical use of strychnine is recorded as far back as the 900s AD in Arabic medical texts. It's been used as a rodenticide since at least 1540, and it spread to Europe on ships, which usually had a lot of rats. It was commonly available in Europe in the 1700s and 1800s as a rat poison and was responsible for many poisoning deaths. Disturbingly, it's been used as a medicine to treat problems ranging from opioid overdoses, heart attacks, digestive problems, and even snake bites. It seems to be the one thing we've discussed so far that I found was not used to treat syphilis or gonorrhea. Strychnine was used as a general tonic to combat shock, which I thought was strange until I found that it seemed to coincide with the discovery and use of chloroform as an anesthetic. It was noted chloroform provided some relief of the symptoms of strychnine poisoning, so interestingly, the reverse was postulated. Perhaps strychnine could be used as an antidote for chloroform overdose. 
This was then extrapolated to use in shock in general. As usual, I'm glad not to have been a physician in the 17 or 1800s because it's hard to believe we haven't always understood shock. In those days, medicine and pharmacology were advancing, but physiology was still poorly understood. The word shock is probably derived from the French shock, meaning jolt or blow. And treatment in those days involved basically anything you can think of. Initially, there weren't even hypodermic needles, so substances were administered via oral, rectal, or inhalational routes. Smelling salts are a great example here. Alcohol was used both orally and rectally for the treatment of shock. Seems like that might burn. Alcohol lowers the blood pressure and makes patients less awake, not more. Once injection became available, it seems like they tried everything, including camphor, alcohol, caffeine, and digitalis. And that's right, you guessed it, strychnine. One physician said, quote, I prefer twitching to a pulseless patient, end quote. The patient's preferences in that case weren't recorded. Strychnine became controversial as higher and higher doses were followed by significant toxicity and suffering. I was surprised to learn strychnine is used as a performance enhancer. Thomas Hicks, a runner in the 1904 Olympic marathon, was dosed by his assistants with a concoction of strychnine, egg whites, and brandy without his knowledge. Despite this, he managed to win the marathon but collapsed after the finish line. It's a banned substance by the International Olympic Committee. In 2016, a weightlifter from Kyrgyzstan was stripped of his bronze medal for doping with strychnine. It's also banned by the World Anti-Doping Agency, or WADA, because it was frequently used by riders for doping in the Tour de France in the early 1900s. Between 1926 and 1928, three Americans a week died from strychnine poisoning, and in 1932 it was the most common cause of poisoning deaths in children. Shockingly enough, it could be found in over-the-counter products in the U.S. until the 1980s in things like digestive aids and cold remedies. Today, fortunately, it's rare and mostly illegal. In the U.S., its only legal use is for mole and gopher bait, formulated in a low concentration. Occasionally, we see a suicidal patient ingesting this bait, but fortunately, ingesting a lethal dose takes a lot. It has been found as an adulterant in drugs of abuse, including cocaine, heroin, and ecstasy. And strychnine is still present in traditional medicine. In Chinese, it's called Makianzi, apologies for the mispronunciation, and used for limb paralysis, rheumatism, and inflammatory disease. In Cambodian, it's called slang nut and used for gastrointestinal problems. So back to our patient, she wakes up and we find out what happened. She's a TikTok star, famous for cooking traditional dishes. She bought the dried seeds from a Chinese traditional medicine pharmacy to use in a recipe. The recipe was unfortunately mistaken, causing her to unintentionally take a lethal dose. This is a fictional case, as are all our cases, to protect the innocent, but it is based on real poisonings that have occurred. A case series from Hong Kong in 2021 documented 12 cases of strychnine poisoning. All patients survived. Interestingly enough, three of the patients were traditional Chinese medicine practitioners themselves. As a famously lethal poison, strychnine has been used by serial killers. In the UK, Christiana Edmonds, called the chocolate cream poisoner, poisoned several and killed a four-year-old child with strychnine-laced chocolates. Serial killer Thomas Neal Cream murdered at least 10 people, including prostitutes and women seeking abortions. It's been used in political assassination attempts. Today's pop culture consult could be its own podcast. Agatha Christie's murderers, of course, love to use strychnine. Arthur Conan Doyle, William Burroughs, Jack London, and H.G. Wells all wrote about it. In film, it was mentioned in Jaws as a strychnine-laced dart was planned to kill the shark. In Psycho, Norman Bates kills his mother and her lover with strychnine. The last question in today's podcast, what is the name for strychnine-contaminated heroin used in the TV series The Wire? A, a fireball, B, a hotshot, C, a speedball, or D, TNT. Post your answers on our Twitter and Instagram feeds, both at PickPoison1. Follow and you'll see the answer when I post it. Remember, never try anything on this podcast at home or anywhere else. Finally, thanks for your attention. I hope you enjoyed listening as much as I enjoyed making the podcast. It helps if you subscribe, leave reviews, and or tell your friends. All the episodes are available on our website, pickpoison.com, Apple, Spotify, or any other location where podcasts are available. Transcripts are available on the website. And while I'm a real doctor, this podcast is fictional, meant for entertainment and educational purposes, not medical advice. 
If you have a medical problem, please see your primary care practitioner. Thank you. Until next time, take care and stay safe.